Micah, that was beautiful. Thank you. Good morning. The Lord be with you. Welcome. My name is Stephen Sanders. I'm one of the pastors at Oak Hill. This morning, I, along with Reverend Missy Jensen and our musicians led by Louise Avant, we are leading in worship on this beautiful day. I am so glad that you've chosen to gather in this sanctuary and be with us today. For those of you who are worshiping with us online, I extend to you a special welcome. I am glad that you are here. Um, one of our pastors, Pastor Ryan Jensen, and is online, and we also have another online host, and we encourage you, if you're using Facebook, to interact with them as much as you can during worship. And if you'd also just type in and let us know that you were here and share any joys or concerns with us, we'll be lifting those in prayer. If you're in the sanctuary, if you would take out, there's a little registration and prayer card in your bulletin. If you would take that out and fill at the top, there's a place for you to fill out your name and contact information. And then at the bottom, there's a place to share any joys or concerns that you have. Um, and we ask that you take that and fill that out and then drop it into a, one of the offering baskets later in worship as part of you offering your prayers and your presence to God. Um, and if you want those, those joys or concerns held in confidence, mark that as pastors only, and we will hold that in a pastoral confidence. Um, finally, over on the far left is an area that we call our playground. It's for our younger ones to be able to be in worship. And so we encourage um, you all to be using that and so our kids can, can worship with families and we gather together. Those are the announcements I have to share. Will you stand with me now as you're able? And I've got a request for you. I'm going to have you turn and greet one another in the sanctuary. But here's the request. Greet someone you don't know. The most lonely time in worship is greeting when those who are new to a church are not welcome. So turn and greet those around you, beginning with people you don't know well.
Now I invite you to remain standing as you are able. And will you join with me as we call ourselves into a time of worship? The words are printed on the screen. Come, bless the Lord, in whom we find our refuge and safety. You are our God. All the good things come from you alone. Come, bless the Lord, who gives us a rich inheritance and surrounds us with abundance. You are our God. Our lives are in your hands. Come, bless the Lord, who guides us on the path to eternal life, whose, whose presence sustains and strengthens us. You are our God. We will not be shaken. Let's worship God together. We join with me and our musicians and lifting your voice to God as we sing together, crown him with many crowns. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth verses. The words are on the screen and on page 327 in your hymnal. Let us lift our voices to God. you to remain standing as you are able as we affirm our faith using uh, the Canadian Creed. The words will be on our screen or you can turn in your hymnals to page 883. Let's affirm our faith. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus the word made flesh to reconcile and make new who works in us and others by the spirit we trust in god we are called to be the church to celebrate god's presence to love and serve others to seek justice and resist evil to proclaim jesus crucified and risen our judge and our hope in life and death and life beyond death god is with us we are not alone thanks be to god amen you may be seated as we come to our time of prayer this morning i remind you that on the inside of your bulletin we have printed our prayer list we invite you to take your bulletin home so that you can continue to pray for these individuals and these situations throughout the week. If you have others that you would like to add, we encourage you to fill out the bottom of your attendance card and place that in the offering plate. 
And for our friends online, if you would type that in the comment, then Pastor Ryan uh, can share that with the rest of the church. Let's go to God in prayer. Holy and loving God, we are in awe of who you are. As we come into this place of worship, we come knowing that you are the source of our life. Oh God, our hearts are grateful for the rain that has fallen upon this thirsty ground this past week and even today. We thank you for the sunshine that follows the rain. We thank you for the cool breeze. Oh God, you provide for our every need. And just as the earth experiences seasons, so we experience seasons in our own life. So God, today we pray that you would meet us exactly where we are. Remind us of your presence in our lives. Oh God, today we lift before you Carrie, Jeannie, Dee, David, Chris, Bob, Fran, Joy, Lavon, Margaret, Carol, Bobby, Emily, George, Shirley, Joy, Susan, Justin and family, Pat, Mike, Poppy, for Chris. God, we are praying for those who mourn. Pray especially for Suzanne Lapinta and her family on the death of her mother, Barbara. We pray for the Smith family as they mourn the death of their daughter, as well as for the Hubbard family on the death of their daughter. And we pray for Janet Sparks and her family as they grieve the death of her husband, Bob. Oh God, there are many more concerns that we keep on our hearts that aren't named aloud. There are even deeper concerns in our hearts where we don't even have the words to express the pain, the grief, the worry. Yet your word promises that your Holy Spirit intercedes. And you know what is on our hearts. So God, we place all of these before your care. And we entrust these persons and situations into your care. God, as we continue our worship series on science and faith, we pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to fall upon us. We celebrate the gifts of reason, intelligence, discernment, and wisdom. Help us to use these tools to strengthen our knowledge about the world and about who you created us to be. Oh God, we are grateful for the gift of medical science and the ways that you have filled us with knowledge to intervene in our bodies and bring healing. Oh God, we pray for your wisdom to continue to fall upon us so that we might discern your goodness in the world. 
God, we join our voices now and we pray the prayer that your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, it is children's time, so I hope the kids in the congregation will come forward and meet me on the steps for our time together. Well, good morning, friends. How are you guys doing? Are you good? Good? Are you all good? All right. How many of you like science? Okay. You know what? I don't like science either. (laughs) This is not a good subject for me. But we're talking about science and worship. Do you think that's okay? Do you think God gave us science, maybe? That is the question, isn't it? Well, today, specifically, we're going to be talking about some medicine. Whose favorite thing is it to take some yucky-tasting medicine? Oh, no. Sometimes we have to do things that we don't like to do, right? How about, have any of you ever fallen and gotten, like, a scrape on your knee or... Monday, it happens, right? Do you love it when it has to be cleaned out? Ouch! I know in our household, whenever I pull out the brown bottle, do y'all have a brown bottle? Ooh, that sends people running. Miraculously, they can walk. <laughs> right? It's not worth that pain to get cleaned out. But do you know that through science, because God gifted us with brains to think and to learn, there were scientists that figured out that these medicines and band-aids and different tools that help to bring healing can actually help. And it kind of doesn't make sense because it hurts, right? Or it tastes yucky. But... We have these gifts to use to help bring healing into our lives. Now, I'm going to read you just a couple of verses from what uh, we'll hear later this morning. But it comes from a book called First Peter, okay? And it says, through faith, you are kept safe by God's power. Sounds good to me. And then it says, you have joy even though you may have to suffer for a little while. But I thought it just said we were going to be kept safe. Huh. I guess that doesn't mean that we're never going to hurt. But perhaps maybe it means that God is always going to be with us. And we'll always be working for our good. Hmm. What do you think about that? Does it sound true? Still true? That's my hope. Is that even when hard things happen, that we'll still have joy. Maybe even if we have to go through something that hurts. That we'll still have strength that comes from God to be able to get through it. All right, let's pray together, and I'm going to say a sentence, and I want to invite you to repeat what I say, okay? 
So let's pray. Good morning, God. Good morning, God. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this day. Thank you for science. Thank you for science. For medicine. For medicine. And for knowledge. And for knowledge. That all brings your healing. That all brings your healing. To our bodies. To our bodies. And our minds. And our minds. And our spirits. We love you, God. We love you, God. Help us to trust in you. Help us to trust in you. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you. Y'all can go back to your seats. Good morning, friends. My name is Vicki Matustic, and I am a member of the staff here. And you may recall that last month, it's still January, last month, we invited you to participate in something that we call the Gifts for the Christ Child. For the previous two years, we focused on food, and our gifts uh, benefited the food bank. This last year, we ask you to think about home and the, what home means to us and what home might mean to someone who does not have a home. So um, we have a short video that we'd like to show you uh, the results of those requests. together as we make uh, the mana bags for the homeless that are sold in the Narthex every Sunday. We assembled the, the packages, the baskets, and uh, wrote notes of encouragement to all of them, wishing them the best and to let them know that Oak Hill will still be praying for their happiness and success. compassion and your generosity, we helped 25 individuals at the Esperanza community know that just as we said this morning, we are not alone. We live in God's world. So do they. And they live there with us. And so I thank you for the, on their behalf and um, for making a home a reality for these 25 people. Um, you did good work, friends. Thank you so much. And I want to make a special thank you to the youth who spent one of their Sunday school hours assembling some of the baskets, and to the Chloe Circle who finished up for us with the last 10 baskets, and to Craig Cannon and Adam Matustic who were your ambassadors making the delivery to Esperanza and helping to unload. So um, together, it's all about being together. So thank you, friends. Generosity changes lives, not just those who receive, but also those who give. And so we encourage you to continue in that generous spirit of making an offering today. Here at Oak Hill, we have three different ways to give. You can use the envelope in the pew and do it the good old-fashioned way of putting something in the plate as it passes by, 
or you can text the number on our screen or even visit our website to make an online donation. But we know that when we give, we're giving to God, and we're giving to God's purposes in the world to help other people know that they are seen and loved and valued. So let's pray and bless these gifts. Lord, you are so good, and you are the one who provides for our every need. And you are the one who calls us into community to support one another through hard times. So God, we pray that you would receive these gifts. We give them to you, trusting that there will still be enough for me and my needs, and that others will come to know your great love. So God, take these gifts Bless them and multiply them as only you can and use them for your purposes in transforming our world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, before I read the scripture, let's uh, have a word of prayer. Eternal God, may your Holy Spirit fall upon us as we study your word and world. Help us to perceive the ways in which you are revealing yourself to us so that we may grow deeper in our relationship with you, with one another, and with all of creation. Amen. I'm reading this morning from the uh, first letter of Peter uh, in the revised uh, standard version, new revised standard version. This section is entitled, A Living Hope. It's the first chapter of Peter, uh, verses three to nine. <clears throat> Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold that, though perishable, is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, which is the salvation of your souls. This is the word of God, and the people say, thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Gracious and eternal God, we pray that you open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit. Take our hands and use them, take our lips and move them. And take our hearts and set them afire with your unending love. Through Christ's most holy name we pray. Amen. For the last couple of weeks in worship and a class that I've been leading, I've been reflecting upon science and faith. I've tried to help us think about such little issues as the Big Bang and evolution. And, and my real goal in this is to to give us permission to be thinking Christians. I think it is okay for us to take both science and our faith seriously, and I think this is a congregation that wants to be able to do that. This morning, I want to try, move from some of those bigger issues to another type of issue and make it a little bit more personal. I'd like to th us to start thinking about how our faith can shape the way we use science. Now, I talked about this idea with the pastors, and one of them said, I think you should talk about the ethics of gene therapy. And I thought to myself, that is not in my wheelhouse. <laughs> but as I thought about what is in my wheelhouse as a pastor, I, I realized that one of the places where, where, where my faith and my role as a pastor, I think, really come together is how does our faith shape the way we use medical science and medical technology. So I want to go that way this morning. Now, those of you in the medical field, you know that, that you already do that type of work. As, as doctors and nurses and technicians and researchers, many of you reflect upon the, the use of medical science and technology and, the, and what you do with that. One of my wife's best friends from college is, oh, how do you say that? a uh, gerontologist, and she um, chairs an ethics committee for a large university health system. And she pulls together groups of people, and they talk about ethics and morality and legal and spiritual issues. The, the medical community does that, but I think we need to be intentional about doing that within the church and within the Christian faith. And the Christian faith really brings together, it brings together two realities when it comes to use of, of medicine, medical science and technology. And, and one of those realities is the importance of healing. 
our human bodies have an amazing ability to heal. This last fall, I was working on a barbed wire fence, and I got a nasty cut across my left arm. I mean, it was, it was a nasty cut. And I cleaned it up, and I don't go to doctors, so I put some Band-Aids and an antibiotic on it. And, and I now, it, a, a, a scab formed on it, but I now have a beautiful four-inch scar on my forearm. But my body was able to heal itself. Sometimes, however, our bodies are not able to heal themselves. They, they need some help, and that's where medical healing comes in. And if you think about Jesus and his ministry, a huge part of Jesus' ministry involved healing. He healed a young girl who had fallen ill, deathly ill. Um, he healed a woman suffering from, a, from a, a years of hemorrhaging. And he, he healed a man with what we would call mental illness today. Healing was central to, to Jesus' ministry. And there are kind of four different forms of healing in which Jesus engaged and that the Bible talks about. There's physical and there's mental healing as well as relational and spiritual healing. Those are those are important elements of Jesus' ministry, and the church, my friends, has, has always seen itself as carrying on Jesus' work of healing. The first disciples, they immediately continued on that work of caring for people who were sick. And, and, and Christians have been instrumental in the founding of hospitals to, to be caring for people. Roman Catholics and Lutherans and Baptists and Episcopalians and yes, even Methodists have established hospital systems because we believe that, that caring for people and providing medical care is central because healing is important. And for the most part, for the most part, the Christian faith, people are happy beneficiaries of, of, of medical care and medical healing. Now, there are a few sects that shun, that shun modern medicine, and I know partisan divides have caused issues over vaccination. But for the most part, my friends, the Christian faith is supportive of the use of modern medicine and technology. I'm just curious. I, I really would like a show of hands. How many of y'all are alive today? because of medical science and technology? I'm just curious. Happy beneficiaries? Yes? So that is one reality that we hold. The other reality, my friends, is the reality of death. I don't know if you realize this, but we are all going to die. Oh, yeah. When, when my wife found out that she was pregnant with our first child, she first told me. And then she, we told the rest of the family. And my brother said, and I quote, Congratulations, Stephen. Do you have a will? <laughs> have I told you he's my older brother and a doctor? It is not a matter of if we will die. It is a matter of when. And my friends, there are a lot of people in this world who don't want to face that reality. One of my jobs as a pastor is to stand with people when they are trying to make medical decisions. And, and I try to listen and reflect and ask good questions so that people can make their own decisions. And a few years ago, I was standing with a family that was trying to, to make a difficult medical decision. The husband had had a, a, a form of cancer and he, uh, several years prior, and he had gone through chemotherapy and it had put the cancer into remission and he had had four or five years of really good health and, and living a vibrant life. But then, then the, the cancer returned and he got really, really sick. And they fir tried first one chemo treatment and then another and then another and nothing worked. And I was in the hospital with him, and I was standing by his bed, and his wife said, the doctor wants to start uh, another chemo treatment today. What do you think we should do? Now, I let you know that as a pastor, I'm not going to tell you what to do, all right? I will help you think about it. I will, I will ask questions. I will, 
I, I will try to help you engage, and I will pray with you. And so we had a good conversation together. And at one point, I got up and I left the room because I just needed a breath of fresh air. And I went and got a cup of coffee, and I went and found their nurse. And this is, this is one of my jobs as a pastor. One of my jobs is to be an advocate and to help people engage in conversation with their health care providers. And I, I went and visited with, with the, the patient's nurse, and I said, their, their doctor is apparently uh, uh, wanting to begin a new chemo treatment today. And they're wrestling with that decision. They need some help in thinking through what to do. And the nurse, he looked at me and he said, Mr. So-and-so is going to die today. His body is already shutting down. His doctor is afraid of death. Whoa. His doctor is afraid of death. Now, I have to let you know, as a pastor, I can deal with that. Because the Christian faith has something to say about that. You see, the Christian faith proclaims that death hurts, death stings, but it does not ultimately prevail. The Christian faith claims that through the resurrection of Jesus, God has overcome the powers of death. And my friends, in my understanding of the Christian faith, the resurrection of Jesus is not just about what God did to Jesus once upon a time. It is about the way God works in this world. The Christian faith recognizes that there is hurt and there is suffering. Peter, in his letter that, that Brad read to us, said, Even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials. Peter doesn't say, if you believe in Jesus, everything's going to be okay. The reality is that we are going to suffer at times in life. But Peter says this, by God's great mercy, God has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You see, the Christian faith claims that yes, we shall suffer, and yes, we shall even die someday. But even then, God is not done with us. For God shall raise us to a new eternal life where there is no more hurt and no more pain and no more sorrow, and God shall wipe every tear from our eye. And my friends, these two realities, the reality of healing and the reality of death, give me a way of thinking about how to, to connect my faith and use my faith to look at how we employ medical technology and medical science. My Christian faith claims the importance and reality of healing, and it celebrates that. As the son and brother and uncle and cousin and friends of numerous doctors, I know that many people who are medical professionals see their work as an extension of their faith in caring for people. As Christians, we celebrate, we celebrate medical science and medical technology and the way that it can be used to help people's bodies heal and to provide comfort. At the same time, we recognize that there shall come a point in life where medical sick science and medical technology is no longer able to provide healing or comfort. And when we reach that point in life, my friends, the Christian faith says it's okay not to continue using medical science and technology simply to prolong life. But there comes a point in life where we can say it's enough. Let me, let me give you two specific examples on how to do this, all right? One of them involves um, ending life support. Medical science and technology has developed incredible things to help, help our bodies heal, to give our bodies time to heal. 
And sometimes people are placed on to life support with the idea of, of giving time for the body to begin to heal itself. Several years ago, I stood with a family where a young, a young dad in his 40s had a heart attack. And, and he was placed upon life support, upon a ventilator, and it did all of the breathing for him. And the hope was that his body would heal enough so that he would be able to breathe on his own and be able to come off life support. But it was not working. And I stood with the family as they wrestled with the question, should we pull the plug? And I'll tell you that as a pastor, I have learned that that is not a helpful question. Should we pull the plug? Seems as though it is making us an active participant in causing someone else to die. And, and that puts a moral burden upon us. Several years ago, I had a Roman Catholic nun give me a different question to ask. And she taught me to ask this question. Is the machine that is keeping your loved one alive, promoting healing and providing comfort, or is that machine keeping your loved one from dying peacefully? That's a very different question. And I shared that question with this family, and they made their decision. Is it okay to disconnect artificial life support? Yeah, because there comes a time when it is no longer leading to healing or providing comfort, and it's simply perpetuating an existence. And morally, it's okay to say, that's enough. Another, another place where I think our faith can really come in is, is, is in hospice care. I'm curious, how many of y'all have heard of hospice? Hospice in the United States is actually pretty recent. It's only within the last 30 years that hospice has become a norm in the United... The, the modern hospice movement has become a norm in the United States. When I first began as a pastor, it, hospice was, was really just getting a foothold in this country. And, and, and the, the basics of hospice are this. This is generally, and so don't go with me on specifics. This is general. Hospice, someone becomes eligible for hospice when her physician says that there is a likelihood of less than six months of life. That's generally what it is. Uh, the body has reached such a point where it is no longer going to be able to he be cured and heal from a disease. And so someone enters into hospice care, and when that happens, it doesn't mean that going into hospice that you're going to die tomorrow. I mean, that's not what it's saying. It says there's approximately six months of life. But what happens in hospice is the, the focus of care shifts. It shifts from trying to cure a disease to what is known as palliative care, trying to help keep someone comfortable and live as fully as possible with the time left. Now, I have a friend who is a cardiothoracic surgeon, and he will correct me and say, Stephen, all of my care is palliative care. But you get the idea, right? In hospice care, there is a shift. And it goes from trying to cure a disease to help someone live fully and comfortably with the time left. Let me share a specific example. Three and a half years ago, my dad fell. Now, my dad was a doctor in San Antonio. In fact, I brought in his microscope, which I think really, really cool, because this thing is really old, because he was really old himself. But my dad was a physician in San Antonio and a medical school professor for 50-some-odd years. And back when he was in his mid-70s, he developed a lymphoma. And he went through a massive series of, of chemotherapy, and then he went through massive radiation that killed off all the bone marrow in his body. He received a stem cell transplant from himself to himself. I don't know quite what happened, but he had like 12 years of really good life after he went through medical procedures that nearly killed him. 
And then, about 12 years after he was pronounced cancer-free, the lymphoma came back, and, and it came back really bad. And he got weaker and weaker, and he fell and he broke his hip, which is often what happens. Older women tend to break their hips through to osteoporosis. I have learned older men tend to break their hips when they have an underlying health condition that has made them weaker. And he broke his hip, and he selected the doctor that he had trained to repair his hip, and the doctor did a really good surgery, and everything came out really well, and then everything turned bad in an instant. And he got really, really sick. And he was in the hospital for about a week. And my mom and I were taking turns, spending the days with him and nights with him. And he told me one afternoon, he said, I'm ready to hang it up. I'm ready to hang it up. And so he and my mom made the decision to quit trying to cure something that could not be cured and to help him live as fully as possible and die as pain-free as possible. And so his care shifted from trying to cure to palliative care, to helping him live fully and comfortably with the time he had. A nurse would come in and occasionally give him a shot of morphine to help ease the pain that he was going through. And then one day the nurse came in and she said, I have to up the dose. And when I give this dose, he's not going to wake up again. Was that okay? Yes. Medical science and technology was not being used to take his life. It was being used to keep him comfortable, even though an end result would be that he was going to die. My friends, my goal is not to give you the answer. We are all, we are all going to face difficult decisions in life about when and how to use medical care. When medical science and technology promotes healing and provides comfort, our Christian faith celebrates it. Yet we also know, we also know that there will come a time where it is no longer able to provide healing or comfort. And then it is okay to say, that's enough. So, my mom and one of her pastors and my wife and our older son and one of our pastors and I, we gathered together in a room with my dad. I pulled out my cell phone so that my brother and sister and all of their kids could call and they could say goodbye to my dad. And then the nurse gave that last bit of morphine. We had a prayer around the bed. And then I heard a knock on the door. I got up to go answer the door. And do you know who was at the door? Death. I looked down the hall, and I said, where are your friends? Because usually pain and sorrow travel with death. And death looked at me and said, I've come alone today. I've come on a mission of mercy. And my friends, the ultimate healing began. Will you join with me in a moment of prayer? Receive this blessing for being human, written by Kate Bowler. Blessed are we, living in this small space, in these bodies we now inhabit, within the walls of circumstance, in these short years and finite strength, and with these eyes that see only so far, we are fragile, contingent beings. 
Yet blessed are we, recognizing that it is our limits as well as our gifts that can shape the natural contours of what is possible, that guide us to what is ours to do. Blessed are we when it is not our greatness that speaks, but our littleness. For it is our vulnerability that is the truest thing about us, the place where mutual connection is possible, where competition ends and community begins. And oh, how blessed we are in our fragility and in our dependence and brokenness knowing that you, O oh God, hold all things together. There is no cure for being human, but for each other, we are all good medicine. Our closing hymn this morning is Easter People Raise Your Voices. And as we sing these verses, we encourage you to pay attention to the words that we are singing. For these words proclaim our hope that death does not have the final word, but God is victorious in our resurrection. That no matter what trials we face in our life or how we suffer, God is with us. And we are Easter people that can face whatever comes our way. So I invite you to stand now and sing joyfully as God's Easter people. If any of you would like to join yourself to our community of faith, you're invited to come forward as we sing, or you can visit with Pastor Stephen or I outside after the service. Let's join our voices in singing our praise. Before I send you out, I'll let you know about three things coming up in the life of this community and encourage you to get plugged in somewhere to grow your faith and to serve God. Um, in the middle of February, our women are having a retreat. 
And it is a time to get away and visit and play and reflect and share and eat and laugh and just be together. So if you are female, over age 18 or older, you are eligible to go on this, all right? Who's going to be out in the foyer area? Vicki Matustic and Janina and Body are going to be out there. And if you are interested, they can help you get connected and be part of that, all right? Um, and then we're trying just to have opportunities to visit and be together after this long, crazy season of life. And so one of the ways that people love to be together is to eat together. And so next Sunday, a group of men are cooking breakfast. It is going to be in the fellowship hall, and we encourage you to come and have a good, heart-healthy breakfast <laughs> and, and enjoy time together and be around the table and visit and get to know people because that is a holy part of living as a church. And then as Easter people, my friends, we believe that we are called to be the hands and feet of Christ in this world. And it's going to get cold this next week. And we may or may not, depending on the weather, be opening up a freeze shelter. And it looks like we may be opening up a shelter at Oak Hill this week for families. For, so with a parent with kids. We're also going to be cooperating with what is going on at Austin Oaks Church and operating the, the community-wise free sh shelter there. So if you are willing to serve in some way, cooking, being present, setting up cots, cleaning up, visit with Vis Vicki Matustic. She is out at the connection station in the foyer and just help us get connected. My friends, this was a heavy one today, but we're all going to face it. Celebrate the goodness of brains and modern medicine that God has made available through incredibly faithful people. And live in this world as an Easter person, trusting that death does not have the final word. Go in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.